We welcome you to another Sunday School lesson. Sunday School is a blessing and gift from God. After Jesus rose from the dead, he showed himself to his disciples on two previous occasions. In the first meeting, Jesus appeared to ten of the disciples for Judas had committed suicide, and Thomas was not there. When he appeared the second time, the eleven disciples were present. John does not tell us why the disciples were back in Galilee, but according to Mark's Gospel, Jesus told them to return there, where he would meet them. About two or three weeks later, they seemed to have been sitting around, on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias, unsure of what to do when Jesus appeared to them again in chapter 21. This is where our lesson begins. Our first verse says, Afterward Jesus appeared again to his disciples, by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. At this time, the resurrected Jesus has made at least three specific appearances to a group of disciples. In another encounter, with women at his tomb, Jesus passed along instructions for the disciples to meet him in Galilee. John typically uses the term Galilee to refer to the region, and the name Sea of Tiberias for the water, because the town of Tiberias was located on the western shore of this lake. Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Lake of Galilee, and this is how it happened. Verse 2 says, Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. It's not clear if all the disciples made their way to Galilee yet, but for now there are seven together. Among them were Simon Peter who confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, and later denied knowing him. Thomas called Didymus, indicating he had either a twin brother or sister, and who was absent when Jesus appeared the first time to his disciples, and declared that he would not believe, unless he could touch the wounds in Jesus' hands and side. There was also Nathaniel who was from Cana in Galilee. He was the one who asked if any good thing could come out of Nazareth, when Philip told him that they had found the Messiah, James and John, the writer of this gospel, and called the sons of Zebedee, and two others who are not named. Verse 3 says, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, We'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Peter once again takes charge and plans to go fishing. Whether he's simply wanting to earn money, or catch food, or stave off boredom, scripture does not say. Nighttime fishing is not unusual, and it's not abnormal for experienced fishermen to come up with much catch on some trips. But something odd happened. They fished all night, but even though these men were veteran fishermen, they caught nothing. These disciples had done what they thought was the right thing, but they only experienced complete failure. However, this prepares them to learn one of the central lessons of discipleship, without Jesus we can do nothing. Jesus had taught them this lesson before, for nowhere in the Gospels do we find the disciples catching fish without Jesus' help. But they needed to have that lesson repeated, just like we need it repeated. Verse 4 says, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. When morning came, there was a single figure standing on the shore, Jesus. However, the disciples didn't recognize him at that time. Maybe it was because of the distance from where they were, or maybe it was not fully daylight, or maybe Jesus prevented his disciples from recognizing him like before, or the disciples were too frustrated by their failure to catch any fish. Verse 5 goes on to say, He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. At this point, the Lord asked them if they had caught any fish. Jesus here calls them friends, the word John often used as an affectionate term when he as a spiritual father, addressed believers who were under his spiritual care. 
we might say that it was a term of endearment. But this greeting was unusual and may have sounded strange to the disciples, because they didn't recognize who it was that was speaking to them. Their answer no, was brief, and maybe a bit embarrassing, since these were professional fishermen. Of course, Jesus knew that they hadn't caught any fish, so he probably asked this question, to show that even though they may have had years of fishing experience, their own abilities to catch any fish that night, were still not enough. Verse 6 says, He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in, because of the large number of fish. After the disciples said that they hadn't caught any fish, Jesus told them to throw their net on the right side of the boat and they will find some. Jesus did not say, try over there and you might find some. Neither does he offer a suggestion. He gives them a promise that they will find fish where he directs them to cast their net. At Jesus' word, John says that when they obeyed, they couldn't even get the net into the boat, because there were so many fish in it. The primary point here is Jesus' lordship, and the need to be obedient to him, in order for any labor or pursuit to be fruitful. Verse 7 says, Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. Once they obeyed the Lord and cast their net on the right side of the boat, John realized that the stranger on the shore was their own Lord and Master. It was John who leaned on the Lord's breast at the Passover table, and who stood by the cross when his Lord suffered and died. It is only fitting that the disciple whom Jesus loved, was the one who was able to discern the identity of the stranger on the shore. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, and recognizing the supernatural power of that event, Peter reacted in faith, and he quickly put on his outer garment out of respect for his master, and dove into the water, wading or swimming to shore. He wanted to get to Jesus. After Peter jumped in the water to swim to Jesus, verse 8 goes on to say, The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. The remaining men, including John himself, are left to tow the boat to shore. They followed Peter in the little boat dragging the net full of fish to the shore. John records that they were not far from land or the shore, only about 300 feet away. When the disciples reached the shore where Jesus was, verse 9 says, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it, and some bread. Jesus prepared a small fire to cook a breakfast of fish and bread. This will set the scene for Jesus to remind Peter of another less happy memory. Both moments will connect as Jesus restores Peter's status as a faithful disciple. When the others reached land, wet, weary and hungry, they found that Jesus had made provision for them. Before his crucifixion, Jesus had served his disciples by washing their dirty feet. Now he continues to serve them as their risen Lord, by providing them with a warm fire and a delicious breakfast. As Christians, we can certainly find comfort in this instance of Christ's care for his disciples. As he did with them, he is also able to supply the things that we need. Verse 10 continues to say, Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. The first one to speak is Jesus, and he tells them to bring him some of the fish that they have caught. Though there's food already being cooked, there's no reason to waste the catch. Jesus' instruction here is practical. Jesus did this because he wanted his disciples to feel they had contributed in some way to the meal. Jesus also wanted them to enjoy his company so he invites them to bring some of their fish and have a meal with him. Christ wants to hang out with his disciples, and he wants to do the same with you and me. Verse 11 says, So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. 
it was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus addressed all the disciples, but Peter went up into the boat, and pulled the net full of fish to the shore. His eagerness to come to Jesus is now matched by his eagerness to obey him by bringing the full net. John tells us the number of fish totaled 150 and 3 which may not carry any deeper meaning. The fishermen had the curiosity to count the fish, perhaps to equally divide among themselves. John also said yet the net was not torn. The fact that the net is full of large fish and did not break, is a second miracle in this appearance of the risen Lord. They didn't lose any of their fish, nor was the net damaged. In contrast to that earlier catch of fish in Luke chapter 5, the unbroken net in John's account may symbolize that there is room in God's family for all people. God desires all people to be saved, and the fact that the net was not torn illustrates that the gospel can catch many people without failing. Verse 12 says, Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. After reaching shore with the net full of fish, Jesus invited the disciples to come and eat. After fishing all night, they had to be hungry. As they prepared to eat, John wrote that no one dared to ask Jesus who he was, because by now they all knew he was the Lord. Throughout this encounter with the Lord, the disciples hadn't said anything. Jesus' body, although a true and real body, was raised a spiritual body just as ours will be. His body was visible only when he wanted it to be. This would cast John's remark as reassurance, even though Jesus' appearance was not exactly as it had been, there was no valid reason to think it was someone else. Verse 13 says, Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. After inviting his disciples to come and eat, Jesus himself comes to the fire. He took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. His actions here were similar to his feeding of the 5,000. The simple act of sharing a meal, especially in the ancient world, represents friendship and trust. The most important thing to see here is that the master, who commands his followers, also serves them, continuing a theme found throughout his ministry. Our final verse says this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples, after he was raised from the dead. John concludes the story by simply saying, that this was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. The first time was when Thomas was absent, and the second time was eight days later when Thomas was present. In the ancient Near East, a host who extended hospitality to others and provided food for them, was implying that he would defend them from then on. Consequently, Jesus' invitation may have been a promise of commitment to them, like the kind offered at the Oriental Covenant meal. Such a meal involved acceptance, forgiveness, and mutual commitment. By accepting his invitation, the disciples were implying that they were committing themselves to Jesus anew. Jesus Cooks Breakfast This lesson revealed Jesus' third appearance to his eleven disciples as a group after his resurrection. In these appearances, Jesus was assuring them of his bodily resurrection and building their faith. He was not a vision or an apparition. He could be touched, he could cook, and he could eat. He also showed himself to be a servant. The disciples carefully recorded these appearances of Jesus, providing evidence of his bodily resurrection for future believers, for us. Jesus Cooks Breakfast 1. Jesus is always with those who obey him, John 21 1-3. If you follow God's directions, you'll be blessed, saved, watched over, taken care of, given what you ask for, and happy, you'll live longer and lack nothing good. 2. We can rest assured that Jesus will do exactly what he says he will do, John 21 4. 
God will decide whether to do or give something to you, or not, or give you something else. So you have to leave that part to God, you should not be worried about that and should trust God. 3. Following Jesus' instructions will always lead to success, John 21 5-6. Obedience to God is not only a way to worship Him, but a way to get closer to Him, prepare for whatever He leads you to, grow as a person to be as successful as He wants you to be. 4. Those who love Jesus will recognize Him and share the good news with others, John 21 7. We must commit ourselves to seeing Him, to recognizing Him and to adoring Him, and talk about the resurrected presence of Jesus all around us. 5. By His power and provision, Jesus can turn nothing into something, John 21 8-9. His ability to make something out of nothing is as old as creation itself, when God's Spirit moved over the vast void and said, Let there be light. 6. Jesus makes preparation and provision for his own, John 21 10-14. When Adam and Eve sinned and their eyes were open to their nakedness, God provided clothes for them. Even when we mess up, God still provides. We are truly glad you spent time to learn this lesson with us. We hope you are blessed and may share these with somebody else. Thank you very much, have a great week and God bless you always, dear brothers and sisters.